Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Amen. Y'all give them a hand. Amen. So I got to share with you, I got to brag on you a little bit more. I know Alan was bragging on you all ago, but this last Friday, uh, we, uh, I got an email that we gave away over 8,500 pounds of meat this last Friday. Is that not crazy? I mean, every week I get that report and uh, it's just so cool to, to see what we get to do around here. And I think like 68 volunteers showed up uh, to get that food away. Got here at 1130 and they were gone by one o'clock. That is just, that's amazing. Amen. And so, hey, yeah, that's okay. We can clap again. Uh, if you got Fridays off and uh, or you get a Friday off and you want to come up here and help out or maybe spend your lunch break if you work in the area, that'd be really cool for you to get to be a part of. That happens every Friday. You can keep track of that on. Uh, Facebook. And so uh, some weeks they move those around and uh, they don't get the shipment. So uh, just watch Facebook, be a part of that. And if not, just pray for them because there are uh, 40 plus ministries every week that gets blessed by what goes on here. It's just kind of cool. I don't know. I, I, I'm bragging on that and just thank you for uh, what you do. Also, I want to say this. Um, as you know, I'm going to be on sabbatical next month. And so I'm like a senior about to graduate high school right now. I have a a little bit of senioritis, um, if that makes sense. I'm ready to be there, and uh, so we're going to be in uh, Estes Park for a little bit and uh, get to hang out with the family up there, and so I, there's part of me that I'm already there, if that makes sense, uh, kind of like graduated from high school. So anyway, I'm really excited and uh, I appreciate you guys letting us rest and uh, do that. You're going to be in great hands uh, with Jake and our elders and the team that uh, uh, they'll be here for the month of March taking care of you. Well, today we're going to wrap this series up on relationships. And, you know, I've told you over the last couple of weeks that if you attended every one of these, they might transform your life. They might transform your relationship. So if you have your Bibles or your apps this morning, you can go ahead and turn over to the book of Hosea. We're going to get there in just a minute. But you know, one of the things I've noticed about from a very young age all the way up, even some of you older, single again uh, folks in the room, is that no matter what our age, we all have a desire for compatibility. There's something in us that, that we're desiring to be with someone we're compatible with. And I know you may be in the room this morning and go, no, you know, I'm not in that search anymore. I'm done, okay? And I get that, but there, you remember a time where you were. Okay, and so as I was thinking through this this last week, I've never been there, but I found this interesting. There's this there's this thing called the Shanghai marriage market in China. It's really crazy. In fact, I want to show you a picture of it uh, because what happens is this goes on for several weeks, and so parents will go and they will build these profiles of their children, and they will uh, advertise their children, their girls and boys, hoping to find a match for their children. Now, teenagers, how would you like for your parents to do that in the room for you this morning, right? I mean, this talk about bad news that mom and dad are going to arrange your marriage. But this, is, this actually goes on. Uh, the news reports actually say that most of the kids don't want their parents to do this, right? And you can see why. But the goal is, is that they would find a suitable partner. And here's what's interesting. I read in the Huffington Post that in terms of content, the advertisements here are the inverse of a Tinder profile. Here's what they are. Pictures and names are scarce, but salary and home ownership status are stated outright. 
And personally, I like that. Amen. I mean, I want to know. Yeah, I want to know whether or not the guy that my daughter's going to marry doesn't live in his mama's basement, right? And 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 has debt up to his wazoo. You know, I want I want him to be there. So I love that whole idea. But you know, no matter what you do, no matter what culture you're in in China or here, there's something about compatibility. In fact, uh, I remember several years ago when I met the very first couple that met online. And, and you know that Match.com has become one of these big. Uh, 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 websites for compatibility. In fact, some of you have met on Match.com. And so here's what they do is they 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 have you sign up for a, um, a, a an account and they put all your stuff in there. You put all your stuff in there. And then when you begin to search, they grab that information of who you're searching. And not only do they grab that information, they will grab the information of the people you're searching and they triangulate that to create this incredible moment of compatibility. And I know that's what you wanted to learn this morning at church, uh, you know, but there's this whole idea that we're looking for compatibility. And, and so there's something in us that we want that. And you may not be looking for it now, but there was a day. And, and what's interesting is the story we're going to look at this morning is the antithesis of a couple that should have been a couple. Homer, no, Jose. I did that in the first service. I, I went... Hosea, not Homer, Hosea and Gomer, how you like that name, uh, so Hosea and Gomer would never have been a couple that Match.com would have put together. In fact, you would not have walked through the Shanghai marriage market and a parent would go, you know, honey, I think that girl right there would be a guy for our, our little preacher boy. It just wouldn't happen. And that's what makes the story so crazy. It's shocking. And you need to understand that the story we're going to look at is not an instructive story. I don't want you to bring four points out of the story and go home and apply it in your marriage because it's not going to be, it's, it's just, it's kind of crazy what the story is. But it's an illustrative story about how God's great love for you and I. It's about God's great love for you and I. And, and when you look at this story, I mean, you may not have heard of it. Some of you have heard of it. Some of you are going to hear some things like, well, I didn't know that in that story. It's going to be shocking because it's irrational. God's love is always irrational. God's love is always shocking. It doesn't make sense from a human's perspective. In fact, you would almost say that God's love is otherworldly. You know, here's a backstory of what's going on in Israel. God had set Israel apart to be his people. And, and, and he set them apart and he gave them the Ten Commandments. And he, when he gave them the Ten Commandments, he wanted them to be separate from all the other pagan cultures around them. And he wanted to set them apart so that he would be on display to all the other pagan cultures around them that he is the one true God. And so about 760 years before Jesus was born, there was Jeroboam II who was reigning over Israel. And he had grown the Israel, the Israel uh, kingdom as large as it had been since Solomon. And so it was a time of prosperity and it was a time where money was rolling in and it was just unprecedented prosperity going on. And as you know what happens often when there's a lot of prosperity and there's a whole lot of uh, unprecedented prosperity, our moral and spiritual compasses sometimes can get off uh, track. In fact, I, somebody said this years ago when I was in the car business, that sometimes our pocketbook will outweigh our principles. That when all of a sudden when money becomes easy and prosperity is everything, we have no need for God. And so what Israel would do is Israel had these times of prosperity where they would abandon God. And they would leave God and God would warn them. And so as they got richer and things were going well, is that sin began to, ran, to run rapid in the, in the children of Israel. And, and the list reads kind of like modern day America. There was swearing and lying and killing and stealing and adultery and drunkenness, perversion, perjury, deceit, oppression. And that's just to name a few. Sounds a lot like home, doesn't it? Sounds like the culture we're living in. Jeroboam the first had set up these golden calves and they were still there and he's the one that kind of opened the whole floodgate for the children of Israel to worship and leave the Lord. And since the Lord viewed Israel as his wife, you'll learn that when you look at the Old Testament, he calls him, calls Israel his wife and he's her husband is that visualization, visualization so we would understand that because in the New Testament, we're called the bride of Jesus. And I know guys don't like, well, I don't want to be a bride. It's this illustration for us to understand the intimacy of the relationship that God wants with his people and then has with his people under Christ. And so since the Lord viewed Israel as his wife, he viewed her worship of other gods as spiritual adultery. And the Old Testament speaks, when you look in Deuteronomy and Judges, the Old Testament speaks frequently of Israel whoring out after or playing the harlot of other gods. 
So you didn't know the Bible said that kind of stuff. Some of you look at that and go, well, that's in the Bible? Yeah, it's there. You ought to read it every once in a while. It's really kind of cool. And uh, God had Israel from the beginning. He told them, you know, the very first command he told them is in Exodus. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, here's what he said. I'm not going to share. I'm not into that. I'm not going to share. I'm the one true God. And so God was about to speak to them. And so what he would do is during this season is he would send prophets. And the prophets would go in and speak to the kings and speak to the people and speak on behalf of God. And the prophets would warn them, look, if you don't turn, then this is what's coming. And there's judgment. And these guys would rain down judgment on them. Man, I mean, they were just brutal on these guys. And there was Amos and some of these guys, and they didn't listen to him. And then God sends Hosea. And what's interesting about Hosea is that his name actually means Jehovah is salvation. And here's what God told him to do. And I, I just get the picture of this whole story that, that here's this little preacher boy that God is sending in to these guys. And look what God asked him to do in Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. He says this, go and marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity. Now you talk about an awkward wedding, Amen. I mean, I went to East Texas Baptist University, okay? And I just cannot imagine God calling me and going, hey, Ed, here's what I want you to do. I, I, I want to save the town of Marshall, which needs to be saved. And so here's what you're going to do. You're going to go down and get a woman of the night off Highway 80. You're going to marry her, and I'm going to put you all on display of how much I love Marshall. Dude, I'd, I'd move. I'm gone. Can you imagine? That's what's going on. I mean, where do, you, where do you even sit at the wedding, right? I mean, they, their friends groups didn't hang out together. They weren't there. I mean, this is just an awkward moment. Why would God ask them to do that? Let's look at it. He says, go and marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity. Why? For the land is committing blatant acts of, pros, of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. So he went and married Gomer, and she conceived and bore him a son. Now, there's some theologians that believe that uh, he didn't ask him to marry a prostitute, just to marry a woman from there symbolically. And, and others believe that she was a woman of, of promiscuity, that it was a real thing. Either way, here's what we know, is that this woman had been greatly affected by her society, and her morals were not very good. As we're fixing to see in just a moment, she really did not make some good decisions. And that's why this is not an instructive story. This is an illustrative story of how much God loves you. So Hosea does what God told him to do. And he takes her as his wife. And it was unlikely. It was an unlikely wife of this budding young preacher to marry a woman of this world and this moral laxity that he brings her in. And so they get married and God gives them a son and they have three children all together. And, uh, and you'll learn as you read this whole story and go through it that that although the first son in the marriage we think was Hosea's, the other two children they have, it's indicated in the scripture that they weren't Hosea's. And yet Hosea raised them. And their first son, you know, names meant something in the Old Testament. Their first son was named Jezreel, which means God's about to humble Israel. I mean, how would you like to have that name carried around, right? And then after the first son was born, then Gomer started kind of disappearing from the house. She started kind of running away and kind of doing about her old ways because remember God said, you're going to marry a woman of promiscuity and you're going to have a marriage of promiscuity. So it wasn't long after their first child was born, excuse me, that she began to go out and have other relationships with other men and he couldn't put his finger on it. He couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Because see, that's what happens in a marriage when there's affairs taking place is you can't quite figure it out, but you'll lay it awake at night wondering where they are. Can you imagine Hosea being there? knowing that his wife is out. And when his suspicions were confirmed is when Gomer got pregnant again. And it was a girl this time. And they named her a name that meant unpitied or unloved. How would you like that name? That your daddy names you unloved? Because it's not his. And again, the name was symbolic of Israel's wandering from God's love and the discipline that she was about to receive. No sooner had that little girl been weaned that Gomer comes up pregnant again. And it was a little boy this time. And his name actually means not my people, not my kin. And so you see this whole thing going on of this alienation from Jehovah that God was putting on display and, 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 and exposing Gomer's sinful escapades. And it's a shocking story. Adultery always is. But now it was all out in the open for Hosea and Gomer. 
She, he couldn't hide her sin any longer. He couldn't cover it up anymore because everybody knew what she was doing. And everybody knew what was going on and the embarrassment and the shame that Hosea had, but he still loved her. He still loved her. In fact, he took her back again after that the child was born. And she promised, and it didn't take long, that, that, that she didn't live up to what she said she would. Her repentance was short-lived. And finally, the final blow comes, and you can read about this in Scripture. We don't know how it came about. We don't know if she left him a note. We don't know if he heard about it, or maybe she told him, I'm done. I'm leaving you. I'm done. And she leaves and goes to another lover. And here he has three kids, single dad, preacher now, raising three kids on his own, and she's left. And yet Hosea still loved her. He longed for her to come home. Hosea wanted to see her restored and believed that God would do it. And then one day he gets word. He hears that Gomer has been deserted by her lover. And she has now gotten so desperate that she has now put herself and sold herself into slavery. And she's hit rock bottom. And Hosea hears about that. And you would think that would be enough, right? That Hosea goes, man, you know what? This is, I'm, I'm just done. I'm just done. And you know his friends were likely sitting there going, well, it's about stinking time. But what did he do? No. He loved her and he couldn't give her up. And in Hosea chapter three, verses one through three, he says, then the Lord said to me, go again and, and show love to a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Just as the Lord loved the Israelites, though they turned to other gods and loved raisin cakes. Now what's in the world does that mean, right? Raisin, I'll tell you what it means. It means God prefers chocolate chips cookies over raisin oatmeal cookies. Amen? Not really. But anyway, here's what it means. It, when they would worship other gods, in their pagan worship, they would, in their worship, they would pass out these raisin cakes and they would devour these in their worship. And so it was symbolic that they had turned to raising, they had turned away from the commands of God, and now they were in worship to these other pagan gods. And so what uh, God was telling uh, Hosea is that, listen, my people have abandoned me, and so I want you to go, and I want you to find her, bring her back as a symbolic action of what I'm going to do for my people. And so we find in verse two, he says, so I bought her. He goes to, he finds her, he rescues her. He's going to, same thing he's going to do. He didn't wait for her to come home. He didn't say, well, God, I'll take her back if she comes home. No, God said, go get her, go find that which is lost. And so in verse two, he goes out, he finds her, he goes after her and her sin. He says, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and five bushels of barley. And I said to her, you're to live with me many days and you must not be promiscuous or belong to any other man and I will act the same towards you. You see, Gomer was so beloved by Hosea that even though she was an adulteress, God wanted him to go seek her out, to go seek out what was lost and prove her love, prove to her that he loves her. He was seeking to save. I mean, how can anybody love that deeply? How could anybody do that? And yet we see that right there in verse one, just as the Lord loves the Israelites. You see, God was telling them all along, listen guys, I, I, I love you. And I'm putting them on display to show you that even though you're an adulteress, I still love you. I'm seeking after you. And so Hosea goes looking for her. Don't miss the picture. He's driven by this love. He, it, it's this crazy, irrational love that he goes after her. And he finds her on that auction block. By this time, she's ragged and torn and sick and dirty and disheveled and destitute, chained to an auction block, filthy, slave, repulsive. And there's his wife. Can you imagine that? I mean, how could anybody love her now that he would sit back and see that? And, and the whole idea that she's been sold into slavery, now she's back up for auction that she ain't even good enough for her slave owner. I mean, this woman has nothing left. It's for sale to the highest bidder. And normally the minimum bid is 30 shekels. This is a preacher with three kids, single dad. All he has is 15 shekels and 30 bushels of barley. That's all he had, everything he had. He negotiated. I don't have anything else. I don't have any other savings. I'll give it all. 
If I can just have her back. It's, it's crazy. We don't find any other story in scripture that's this crazy and outrageous and irrational and it's difficult and beautiful. But its purpose is not that we'd look at this troubled and painful marriage. No, no, no. Its, it's purpose is, is that the Lord who has a bride, a people, and they're unfaithful to him and his incredible love for them. And here's the aha moment. Here's the aha moment is that we are Gomer and Jesus is Hosea. I know. Because you see, we're no different than Gomer who went and slept with other lovers that we sleep with other lovers. And what I mean by that is some of us sleep with money because money is our lover. And it's all about our dollars and how much we have and how much we keep and how much we give. Some of it's about popularity that we don't trust that God is adequate enough to take care of us. And so we're always chasing popularity and acceptance from the world that will never give us, that will wear us out. And yet God shows us some of us, it's our possessions and power. Some of us have totally forsaken God for careers and politics. Never seen a season where the, the people of God have abandoned God for a political party. Some of us will talk about our love for God, but we're involved in so many other beds and we keep one here, one there. And through it all, what does God decide to do? And this is where it's shocking. What did God decide to do then and what has God done today? This is so otherworldly that it's almost shocking to the system. And I think sometimes we get so used to hearing it, it doesn't shock us anymore. That what God did is he sent Jesus on a mission to find us and he knew we would be just like Gomer. And he sent him anyway. It's a beautiful story. He seeks and saves and finds us in slavery of our sin. And he pays everything he has for us. He purchases us with everything he has. And here's what the story of Hosea illustrates. That God chose to redeem or buy back his bride. And the cost was outrageous. It cost him everything. Look at 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. It says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Christ, a lamb without blemish and defect. God paid dearly for us to buy us back, which kind of brings us back to that original passage we've been looking at over the last few weeks in 1 Corinthians 13, where we've been talking about this thing of love. In fact, I want to read it again because we see that the one true love is Jesus and he loves us in this way, shocking and otherworldly. Look at it. It says, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it is not boastful, it is not arrogant, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I've seen preachers take that passage and say, married couples, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fill your name into that. I want you to put your name every time there's love. And I'm just telling you, that's probably the worst translation of that passage you could possibly do. It's an abuse of the passage. Because can you imagine the condemnation if I ask you to do that this morning? That you're sitting by your wife? And so I'm going to read this. Edward is patient, knowing all along my wife is sitting right here and going, well, <laughs> not all the time. Because I wasn't very patient yesterday morning on 2015 going to a conference when that lady wouldn't go over 40 miles an hour, amen? How about this one? Edward is kind most of the time, but not all the time. How about Edward does not envy? Do Skeeter boats count? Amen? No one fills this list perfectly. There's only one who pulls this off, and his name is Jesus. So here's what I want to do. I want to reread that. And this time, everywhere there's love, I want to put Jesus in there. Look at it. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. He is not boastful. He is not arrogant. He's not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not irritable. Aren't you glad? 
He does not keep a record of wrongs. Amen. He finds no joy in unrighteousness, but he rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. Jesus never ends. I want to close this series by mentioning four things. And the first thing I want to mention this morning is, is that Jesus bears all things. That, that term, bears all things, literally means to cover in a cloak of silence or darkness. And it's so beautiful because here's what happened. When Jesus was on the cross, he bore in his body my guilt and your shame and your guilt and my shame. And he covered and hid it in himself so that the loudness of my sin has been silenced. It's been silenced. And when Hosea walked through that crowd to purchase his wife, can you imagine as he walked through that crowd to purchase his wife from another man, all the eyes were on the naked body of Gomer. That ragtag, shameful body, all the eyes are on her. All there's there, we're looking at her. And he walks through that crowd, moving through the crowd. Can you imagine all the shame he was bearing that all these people looking at her, that he's, he's taking all of that shame as he walks through. And then he does the one thing that's otherworldly. And he says, I'll buy her. And all the eyes that were on her immediately turned and were on him. He took all the shame he took all the guilt, he took all the filth off of her, and he took it upon himself. I love that uh, picture that Jesus bore in his flesh, all of my guilt, all of it. I'm no longer being stared at as shameful and dirty because Jesus took that. I love what Charles Spurgeon says, as far as God is concerned, your sin has ceased to be. He laid it on Jesus, your substitute, and he took it and bore the penalty of it. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus bears all things. But here's the second thing. Jesus believes all things. And in the terms of that original language, it means that Jesus finds no fault where there is no fault. In other words, he's not looking for fault in you. He's not following you around with a checklist waiting for you to mess up. Isn't that good? He finds no fault. He's not walking around behind you keeping a record of all you do wrong every day. That would be exhausting, wouldn't it? Some of you are married to someone like that. Some of you work for someone like that. Some of you have friends like that. They're just walking around waiting for you to mess up. It's exhausting. That's not who Jesus is. Because Jesus walks with you because he believes all things for you. He believes in you and what he will do in you. Listen to me. He does not love a future version of you. He loves you right now. I'll say that again. He doesn't love a future version of you. He loves you right now. Now, he knows what that future version is going to do because he's going to transform you, man. It's good. He's going to change you. He believes all things. Number three, he hopes all things. That means he holds on to hope in the face of opposition. And can I just be honest with you? I have a lot of opposition to Jesus in my life. Because I'm still filled with my brokenness and my struggles and I still sin and I still oppose Jesus. So I love the fact that Jesus holds on to me even when I don't hold on to him. That's good. That's good. And by the way, there's no one in this room that always holds on to Jesus. I don't care how old you are or how long you follow Jesus. And that's why Jesus hopes all things. That your faithfulness is just as fragile as my faithfulness on any given day. And Jesus hopes all things for you. And he's hoping all things for you. And his love is consistent for us. We are the ones that are inconsistent. He is consistent, always hoping, always holding on. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. And number four, he endures all things. He is enduring. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. His love is eternal. You can't stop him from loving you. 
You can't get away from him. His love is irrational. It doesn't make sense. Because some of you are going, how can God love me? Because I know what I've done. I destroyed my marriage. I've destroyed my kids. I've destroyed my career. I've destroyed my life with habits and hurts and hangups. How can God love me? Because his love is irrational. I'm telling you. There's nothing we can do to change him. So Hosea and Gomer were not a good match. I'm telling you, match.com wouldn't have put them together. Doesn't make sense, the Shanghai marriage market. Do you know what a bigger mismatch is than Hosea and Gomer? It's Jesus and me. You know what a bigger mismatch than Hosea and Gomer? It's Jesus and you. Because Jesus is holy. And that means he's otherworldly, pure. He is perfect. He is righteous. And I am none of those things. Do you know if my portfolio was at the Shanghai marriage market, you know what it would read? Edward has wandered from God. He's pursued things less than God. And Edward has found his identity and accomplishments in his job. He's not been the perfect husband. He's not been the perfect father. And Edward has fallen short of the glory of God. That's my portfolio. That's my portfolio. And you know what the portfolio of Jesus is? It's simple. The perfect one. Holy one of God. Righteous Savior. King of kings and Lord of lords. Redeemer. My portfolio does not match God's portfolio. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus looks at my portfolio of sin and brokenness. And he says, Edward, if you're willing, I'll give you my portfolio. And I'll take yours. And I'll put yours on and bear that and you can have mine. And the great exchange takes place. It doesn't make sense, does it? It's otherworldly to think that Jesus would do that. The great exchange. Great Martin Luther, the reformer, says that faith unites the soul with Christ as a spouse with her husband. Everything which Christ has become, everything which Christ has becomes the property of the believing soul. Everything which the soul has becomes the property of Christ. Christ possesses all blessings and eternal life, and they are thenceforward the property of the soul. The soul has all the iniquities and sins, and they become thenceforward the property of Christ. It is then a blessed exchange commences. Jesus takes all of our ragged and torn and dirty and disheveled and destitute. We're on the slave block, naked, with nothing to offer. And Jesus says, I'll, I'll take them. And he gives everything he has for us so that you and I can take on his identity. He takes all of our ragged and torn and sick and dirty, disheveled, destitute life, the chains of guilt, shame, and all the filthiness and brokenness, and he bears those. And church, listen to me. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That Jesus offers us a great exchange. That all we have to do is take his identity, and he'll take ours, and he'll bear it. And that's what he did on the cross for those of us that'll surrender our life to him. And so here's what I wanna do as we close this this morning. I'm gonna ask the band to come back. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you realize for the first time that you're Gomer. That you're Gomer. That you are nothing to offer. Your sin has broken you and driven you in the ground. And there is no hope for you. And this morning, what you've heard is that Hosea is looking for you, and his name is Jesus. And he is wanting to find you this morning. And so I want to invite you to meet him this morning. In just a moment, I'm going to have some folks across the front, and they would love to introduce you to Jesus Christ. They would love to lead you in a prayer of surrender to him, that you would invite him to be your Lord and Savior. And I'd love to see you as well be baptized 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you this morning to do that. Maybe this morning you, you've run away, but you realize it's time for you to come home. You know God. And you just need to repent and change your mind and think like God. For others of us, I want to invite you to take communion. Two tables in front, two in the back. If you have a relationship with Jesus, we invite you to worship with us this morning. But I want you to know this morning, there's an opportunity for some of you to surrender your life to Jesus. It's a blessed exchange. It doesn't make any sense. It's irrational. It's otherworldly love. But he loves you. And he is searching for you. Will you surrender? So Lord, I love you. Thank you this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these beautiful pictures. Both beautiful and tragic, God, of Hosea. And yet, God, that's us. Thank you, Lord, that you saved me 35 years ago, just right down the road, Father, as you came in to my life to be the Lord and the Savior of my life, that that great exchange took place at a place called Brookhaven Encampment. God, thank you that you're not done with me. You're still in the process of taking those things that, that I still fight and transforming me every day, every week. So Lord, I pray for the one that sits here this morning that's never given their life to you. God, would you give them courage in just a moment as we're all moving in this room, taking communion, praying. God, would you give them courage to come to one of our prayer warriors, one of our elders across this front. And God, would you give them courage this morning to surrender their life to you. And God, would you save them today for that prodigal that's running God, would you woo them back home? God, thank you that you bear all things, believe all things, hope all things. And God, you never change. Thank you. I love you. And we ask all these things in that beautiful name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Let's Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen, and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day, and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.